as we come together remotely this week, uh, we gather around the letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church. Uh, and especially, I want to look at the last few chapters. Our text for Sunday is, as you can see on the screen, uh, Romans 15, the first seven verses. Uh, but I want to look at the larger context in this setting. We can explore beyond our specific sermon text. Um, Paul's uh, main concern in this section of Romans, beginning back in chapter 12, uh, Paul's concern is not how Christians are to conduct themselves in the larger uh, world, uh, but how we express our uh, new life in Christ within the uh, faith community, within our Christian faith community. Uh, we live in our faith uh, with within three dimensions, I think. One, uh, we have the one-on-one -on -one faith, our personal uh, relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then we have our relationship with God through Jesus Christ as we express that relationship with other believers within our uh, local congregation, which is a part of the larger church. And then uh, we uh, express our faith uh, in the general community, the general society, uh, as we live out that faith as a witness to interacting with people in the community. Uh, it is not that, and, and today, and, and what Paul is doing in beginning in Romans 12, is talking about how we live out our faith in relation to other believers within our uh, Christian community. Uh, it's not that society and how we react to it is not important, but that's not Paul's focus here. As a part of the Christian community, as well as individually as believers, uh, we are to witness to the reality of Jesus in our lives. The church does, individual believers do. Uh, in, on one hand, the Christian community is the context in which individual believers grow to their full measure uh, in, of their Christian faith. Uh, on the other hand, the, the love which marks the Christian fellowship, uh, which marks the relationships believers have, that is a powerful testimony uh, of Christ's presence. And that testimony uh, is seen and heard and felt by the larger society. But in order for these purposes, for us to grow individually, for our love uh, to be growing uh, as a witness to ourselves and to the community uh, beyond us, for these purposes to be achieved, we must truly be, first of all, righteous, uh, right with God. But we also must be a loving community. Uh, and the scripture describes this with a word uh, which means uh, in in or with one accord. And that doesn't mean we're all uh, driving in the same Honda or owning the same uh, make of automobile. I'm sorry, that's a bad joke. Uh, but the, the, the term scripture uses is with one accord, uh, in one accord. Um, I'm grateful for Ella Richards' teacher's commentary for some of the, uh, the thoughts that uh, I want to share with you today uh, this this word, which is translated with several words in the English language with one accord, is a word that um, is used to describe the uh, relationship, the fellowship uh, that existed within uh, the first uh, century churches, uh, or at least within the church in in Rome. The church that that word. Um, gets at the unique uh, love and, and, and harmony that was, um, that was felt between these early believers and, and impressed so much those outside the church who observed the church. See how they love one another was one way uh, it was described. These early Christians, they were varied in their background. Some were rich, some were poor, some were uh, Judean Christians, uh, Judean uh, Jews who had become Christians, and some of them were Jewish, but they had uh, they came from well outside the Judean area. So there's a great deal of difference in their day-to-day uh, -day culture. But 
regardless of their differences or perhaps because of their differences, they found a unity and a love that observers outside the church looking in, uh, there was so much love and unity, observers could, could hardly believe it. Uh, now, Jesus spoke of this uh, dimension of Christian community before his crucifixion. He told his followers, love one another as I have loved you. Uh, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Find that in John 13. So God's plan for believers includes the demonstration of God's righteousness in and through a loving community. Uh, Christ's church, universal, made up of many local congregations, Christ's church is to demonstrate to all the world that righteousness correctly understood means love and joy. So it's really no wonder then that, that Paul described uh, attitudes here in Romans, attitudes toward others, which builds this Christian community. Uh, and, and each of these attitudes, and, and Paul alludes to this, each of these attitudes reflects Jesus' attitude toward us. Uh, one of the attitudes that Paul says is significant for believers uh, is um, he, he talks about in, in Romans 14. I'll read a few verses from that. Uh, now receive the one, this is Romans 14, begin verse one, receive the one who is weak in faith, but not for quarrels about opinions. One believes he may eat all things, but the one who is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats must not despise the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat must not judge the one who eats, because God has accepted him. Who are you who passes judgment on the domestic slave belonging to someone else? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Uh, now, uh, Paul's dealing with an issue which often created conflict in churches in the first century, and it still does and that is opinions or convictions. Now, these are not matters which Scripture clearly identifies uh, as sin. These are, however, issues which seem wrong to some believers, right to others, and to still others, they don't really care. They just, they don't register uh, for others. Uh, and, and, and we know that we all differ in opinions uh, and from others with even within our local church in, signif in significant ways. Uh, we have different opinions about what a believer should and shouldn't do. Some think women should be ordained. Others vehemently disagree. I know what some people outside our church think about us because we ordain women. I've heard some of the comments. Uh, some in Paul's day thought it was Christian to be a vegetarian. Others liked a good hamburger. Uh, some felt that Christians should observe special holy days, and others said, no, every day is the same. Each day is created by God for God's glory. Now, all of these differences, and there were many others, and there are many others, all of these differences tended uh, then, as now, to divide believers into groups of them and us. Always makes me uh, tighten up uh, when I hear a church member talking about another church member as them. Uh, we've, we've created division. And, and every antagonistic division, whether it's meant to or not, all antagonistic divisions are harmful to the Christian community. All of them distort the unity and the ministry of, of the Church of Jesus Christ. So how does Paul teach in Romans that we are to deal with these differences of opinions or ideas? Well, in, 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 in Romans, he says that, uh, Romans 15, he suggests uh, several positive steps and attitudes that we are to develop. You've got... Um, Romans 15 in front of you, uh, he says, but we are we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good 
for his neighbor's good for the purpose of edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but just as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written beforehand was written for our instruction in order that through patient endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. Now may the God of patient endurance and of encouragement grant you to be in agreement with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that with one mind you may glorify with one mouth the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also has, has accepted you to the glory of God. So how does Paul say we are to deal with these differences? Well, he says positively uh, we are, verse 1, we are to actively welcome even those who have a weak faith. Even a weak faith is faith. A person with weak Christian faith is still a Christian brother or sister. Remember Jesus teaching that even if you have faith that can be compared to the size of a tiny mustard seed, you have faith. A second thing Paul says, beginning verse 6 here, is that we are to recognize Jesus as Lord. Christ rose, Christ lives so that Christ might be Lord for his people. Each of us individually is responsible to Jesus as Lord. We are not responsible to each other. Paul says uh, that a servant or slave is subject to his or her master, uh, has to please that master, doesn't have to worry about pleasing anybody else. And Paul says we are servants of Christ. So therefore, each of us individually is responsible uh, and answerable to our master, Jesus. We are not responsible to, in that sense, each other. Third thing he says here in verse 5, we are to each of us to explore the issues uh, over which we have convictions and be fully convinced, he says, verse 5, uh, be fully convinced uh, in, in, in our own uh, in, in our own mind, uh, uh, this is uh, this is in Romans fourteen verse five. Some judge one day to be better than another, while other while others judge all days to be like. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. In other words, use the brain God gave us uh, to explore issues uh, and make sure that our opinions are well-founded and that we are convinced by study, by prayer, by allowing the Spirit to guide us that we are convinced our opinions are legitimate. Not that they're better than someone else's or are more right than someone else's, but that they are legitimate for us. Now, Paul also deals uh, in, from a negative perspective about what not to do in our relationships with other Christians. Uh, we are not uh, to condemn others whose convictions differ from ours. Uh, we are not to look down on them for being less spiritual than us. Uh, we're not to judge them at all. Um, Jesus is Lord. They are responsible for him. We already talked about that. Uh, if they have sinned, Jesus will judge them. We have no business intruding into... Uh, the responsibility of another believer to Jesus or Jesus to that individual believer. Uh, we intrude in this relationship of responsibility of a fellow believer to the Lord. Uh, Paul says, look to Christ as our model. Accept one another. This is 15.7. Accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Why? In order to bring praise to God. Uh, God doesn't condemn the brother or sister. We judge, but God accepts that brother or sister. Romans 14, 3. As far as that brother or sister's future is concerned, Jesus is able to make our brother or sister stand. Uh, they continue uh, that good relationship. How, how important then that like Jesus, we love and accept each other and try to build up each other. 
rather than to down tear down one another because of the ways in which we differ. I think that teaching has ever been more important, at least in our lifetimes, uh, than now with all of the different ways that our culture is dividing and those divisions are finding their way into the church. And in many cases, individual believers seem to be gravitating to those divisions and, and seeking to bring them into the church. Another way that Paul says deal with this is, is through self-sacrifice, beginning in Romans 14, 13, going through this section and beyond. Uh, often the differences that do exist between individual believers uh, bring uh, strife uh, into the entire church, into the entire fellowship. Uh, some who have the freedom to do what others question may in the exercise of that freedom cause uh, other believers harm. Um, if I don't think a particular activity is a problem, but my brother does think it's a problem, what do I do? I'm free to do it. I don't have any conscience uh, uh, that, that bothers me about this particular activity. For instance, eating meat. Uh, the first century would have dealt with that. It had something to do with uh, idol worship. Could they eat meat that had been offered to idols? Uh, because there was this sense that if it had been offered to the idol, the spirit of that idol or the spirit of that false god was in that meat. And if I eat it, then that spirit would contaminate me. Well, the mature believer says, I don't, first of all, don't believe in that false god. It is a false god, so that it has no power. So it, there's no way it's spirit. It doesn't have a spirit. It's a false god. Uh, so if I eat the meat, it doesn't bother me in any way. But a less mature believer who's still coming out of that idolatrous background perhaps would be bothered seeing another believer eating that meat because that less mature believer uh, is still not completely convinced that there's not something to uh, that idol, uh, the spirit of that idol coming to reside in the believer. So if I eat meat, especially in the presence of that believer or announce to that immature believer that I have no problem with it, then I may cause that weaker brother or sister to stumble. And Paul's very clear here. Nothing that is not identified in Scripture as sin, nothing is unclean or wrong in itself. But, very important to realize, though nothing that's not identified in Scripture as sin is unclean or wrong in itself, Neither is it more important than our brother or our sister. So that means Christians walk a fine line here. We affirm our freedom and our responsibility to live by our own convictions. We are answerable to the Lord for them individually. Yet we are careful not to flaunt our freedom so that others may follow our example despite personal doubts, which would cause them to stumble, or they may condemn us for what we ourselves believe to be good and right. Think about it like this. Is there any one of your freedoms worth the spiritual downfall of your brother or sister? I'm not talking about political freedoms. I'm talking about your freedom of living out your personal life. So Paul gives us several practical, practical suggestions in this area. Uh, in chapter 14, he says, whatever you believe out about these things, keep between yourself and God. And make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification, mutual building up. In 15.1, we've already looked at it. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. We'll talk about that some more on Sunday. We also talk some more on Sunday about the goal toward which we're to work, giving it priority rather than giving our conviction priority, is that with one heart and mouth, we may together glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this together glorifying the Lord and God 
the glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is definitely true for us at 1030 on Sunday morning. But it's also true when we encounter each other at the grocery store or at the ball game or when we're talking across the back fence. This idea of worship is not limited to 1030 on Sunday morning when we gather with a larger group. This idea of glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is not limited to what we do with the larger group. It is always forefront in our minds individually and as we encounter each other, whether it's one-on-one -on -one small group in an informal setting or in the formal setting of worship. Always, our purpose is to seek to glorify God alone and with our Christian community, one person or many people. We'll continue this conversation on Sunday morning. Before we move into, uh, or before we conclude uh, today's uh, time together, I'd like to share with you our uh, prayer list and uh, pray with you uh, for these who have either asked that their names be put on or someone else has asked. Uh, some of them are, are before us every week because they have ongoing issues. Uh, others uh, are brought to us uh, from time to time. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, Lord, we continue praying for Linda Gowan. We know that she faces ongoing health issues. Thank you for the strength you give her and the determination she has to continue ministering to you, uh, for you, uh, to sharing fellowship with us. Uh, bless her this day. Uh, soothe pain and uh, show her good solutions moving forward. We pray for Donnie Waters as he continues the process moving toward a transplant. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will even now begin to uh, prepare his body to uh, positively accept uh, what is offered and to and respond to it in a healing manner. We pray for Pat Mitchell. Lord, we pray for Doris Wilkins and for Grady Reinhardt, each of them. Uh, facing uh, ongoing uh, health issues. Uh, Lord, in a similar manner, we pray for Doris Walkowitz and for our friend Kirby. We pray for Jim Berry approaching a, a dental procedure and Gary Ravan as he prepares for uh, surgery and the rehabilitation that will follow that. We pray with Kathy for her sister, uh, Joyce Ann, with the health issues that she's facing. We pray with Sherman uh, Swafford uh, for his sister, Gail. And we celebrate with Ginger Ridings uh, as uh, she shares the news with us that her daughter is expecting a child. Um, we pray that that pregnancy will go smoothly uh, and that there will uh, soon be a grandchild in Ginger's life. Lord, we pray for our nursing home members, for Ruby McDowell and Ramona Settle, pray for Mickey Pruitt and Sarah Trout, for Bill Cothran, for Alice Warren. We hold up Honda Barnwell and Duff and Barbara Wells, and we pray for Betty Campbell. Lord, each of these uh, men and women uh, has a relationship with you, and we know that you uh, minister to them in some cases, in, in, communicating with them as only you can do. Uh, Lord, show them your love and your mercy and help us as their church to continue to include them in our fellowship. Lord, we pray for others that have been brought before us for Dean Daphne and Steve Bailey. We pray for Connie Eubanks and uh, Charlene Connorsman. We pray for K. Smith's son. Lord, we also pray for the families of the, uh, the victims of the shooting that we are just hearing about in the last 24 hours. Uh, Lord, we don't know the circumstances and we don't have to know the circumstances, but we know they're grieving families. Lord, we hold them up, even if we don't know them personally. and pray that we may be a part in some way, even indirectly, of healing in their lives. Lord, we pray for our deacons. Thank you for these men and women who are willing to serve you uh, by serving uh, our church. Uh, minister to them and minister through them so that your uh, your body, your, your church uh, may be 
uh, more and more, uh, truly a community of faith whose unity is on display to our to our larger society so that they may see that being in Christ and being in Christ's community uh, is a makes a, a positive difference in our lives. And may they be amazed, not at us, but at the unity that exists among us because of your spirit. Lord, we anticipate being in worship together on Sunday and pray that in that worship, we will show you praise, but may we never limit our worship uh, to an hour on Sunday or just to when we gather together with our church and when we gather physically. May at all times we seek to be living a worshipful life as we give you honor and glory by all that we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining uh, with me uh, today. I uh, pray that uh, this will be a great day for you, and I look forward to sharing with you uh, in, the, in the coming days as we worship and work together.